Hello, welcome to our talk today for the Cambridge Festival on how to lose a billion dollars, technology's most expensive mistakes. I'm delighted that you can all join us this afternoon and we're really looking forward to our first in a series of events for the Cambridge Festival. So our speaker tonight is Dr. Ems Lord, who's the director of the Enrich Maths programme here at the University of Cambridge and also past president of the Mathematical Association, the oldest subject association for maths teachers in the United Kingdom. We're really pleased that Ems has agreed to talk today and we hope that we may have a couple of minutes at the end for any questions. If you do have questions, you can type them to us using the Q&A facility during the talk. But you're here to listen to Ems rather than to me. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over and welcome Dr. Ems Lord to talk to us tonight about technology's most expensive mistakes. Thank you, Ems, over to you. Thank you very much, Julia. And welcome to everybody who's come along to join us this evening. We're going on a journey. We're gonna explore some inspiring tech projects and where they went wrong. Now, I'm Ems Lord and I'm a mathematician. Ever since I was a very young age, I've been absolutely fascinated by the ways that we can work with numbers. And that fascination has led to my interest in the different strategies and approaches we can use and why sometimes we get things wrong. And how we might avoid some of those mistakes in the future. So sit back, enjoy our journey and let's explore some of technology's most expensive mistakes together. Now, whenever we think about doing a new tech project, there's three key factors I think are essential for it to be successful. You might disagree with me on these, but these are three that I've come up with. Now, the first one, to achieve your ambition, you've got to have an idea, a plan, a vision. So tech projects need to be ambitious. So whatever we're going to look at this evening, it's an ambitious plan. That's number one. However, having ambition is just not enough. As you're very well aware, any project then needs to be funded, well funded. So you have your idea and then you have your funding. And in many cases, people think that's it, sorted. Got a great idea. I've got the money to do it, off we go. However, when we're looking to why some very high profile tech projects have just gone horribly wrong, there's something that's common, a thread that goes through all of these ones where it's just gone horribly wrong. And it's that something which I'm fascinated by and I look at in my research. And that's number sense. Now, it might surprise you that when we're talking about high tech projects, we're talking about number sense. But let me share a little bit about what it is I mean, because it's a term you may not have come across before. But number sense is something I reckon you're probably using every day, even if you don't realise it. Whether you're deciding whether your car will really fit into that last remaining space in the supermarket car park, or you have to go all the way around again till there's a larger one, or you're filling the basket once you've got in the supermarket and trying to remain within that budget you're, you set yourself. What you're actually doing is using your number sense. It's about having a feel for numbers. And for me, that goes beyond knowing your times tables and the number bonds that we teach when the children are at primary school. It's not that they don't need to know them, but in order to use numbers well in everyday life, we have to go a little bit further and have that feel for them, to be able to play with them confidently. And using our number sense, it lets us make sensible estimates, such as will our car fit in that space, and to check our answers. So, what about some everyday examples of number sense that we might come across? Well, there we go, there's a mountain bike. I love mountain biking, so it's an obvious choice to share with you. Now, if I was to ask you how much you think 
a mountain bike might cost, I'm sure we'll get a huge range of answers. But if we're just looking for an everyday mountain bike, one that would take us to the supermarket once we've realised it's really hard to get that parking space that fits, or we want to go out for a Sunday afternoon ride, how much would it cost an everyday mountain bike? I'm thinking maybe 150, maybe 200. How about if we bought six of them? Okay, that's a very excited bike shop owner. We've just gone in and ordered six. I'd expect to get a discount. Now, there was a situation recently where somebody did go and buy six mountain bikes and the deal they got on them was just under a thousand pounds. They paid 984 pounds. That was the agreed invoice. That certain person or that certain company was Tesco's. So Tesco's ordered six mountain bikes for 984 pounds and they ordered them from Sports Direct. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the mountain bikes were delivered, no problem at all, and the invoice was paid. You'd think, again, no problems. However, when somebody in the Tesco accounts department was checking their invoices that had been paid, they realised the bill wasn't for £984 that they paid. They'd mistakenly paid £984,000. That's quite a price hike on the mountain bikes. It was simple human error. Somebody typing in the number had got it wrong. But why do mistakes like that happen? After all, if you were work, working at the sports company and somebody pays you all that money, what do you do? Do you give it back? Do you keep it and hope they learn next time? This particular incident went to court papers. It all got settled in the end. But how do we avoid errors like that? And sometimes, it's about valuing our number sense, no matter what it is we're doing. So if we're the person processing the invoice, sometimes just saying, does that make sense? There's a wonderful maths educator called Margaret Brown, who's done a lot of research in this area about calculations in context. Now, how about when we think about it in the context, not of a bill of 984,000, but a bill for six mountain bikes, when we do that, we tend in our own everyday lives to make less mistakes. So that's a low tech example of why it matters to keep an eye on and value our number sense. But we're here tonight to go on a journey and explore where number sense had le has led to some disastrous mistakes with very high tech projects. So without any further ado, let's see the contenders for our top five. So we have an example by land, high tech project bringing in new high speed trains. We have one going under the ocean with a submarine upgrade project. We're going to look at aviation and what went wrong with one of these jet airliners. We're going into our own atmosphere with a satellite launch and we're going into outer space and visiting another planet. So that's our top five. And I guess one question for you to start thinking about is, which order would you put them in? Which were the most expensive mistakes? Okay, we're gonna have a go at all of them and we'll come up with a chart of our top five. Another question for you though, is the title of the talk. Okay, it was how to lose a billion dollars. Why have I worked in dollars? Well, because we're comparing projects from all over the world. So using one unit, was very helpful for planning this talk and as we go along you'll see some of the other benefits for sticking to single units as well. The other thing that I find really useful is to get a feel for what a billion looks like because we start banding around these numbers billions, millions, trillions but what does it mean? So a dollar bill. Now I haven't handled a dollar bill um, I had to go and look it up and see the dimensions, but I'm reliably informed a dollar bill is about six inches long and that's about 15 centimetres. OK, so if we laid them end to end, how far do you think we'd get if we had a billion? Just to give us an idea of the sorts of numbers that we're talking about here this evening. Well, one of those, I reckon, is about the length of my hand. 
Okay, I think that's about six inches, give or take. So how about if I got a thousand of them? How long would that take me? Well, I think the standard thing is to use London buses, isn't it? So how many London buses might we need if we're going to stretch out a thousand dollars? And I reckon it's about eight London buses. Okay, so starting to get a feel for the money here. I suppose the next one, if we're looking at these numbers, is a million. If we had a million dollars, how far is that going to take us? Well, thinking about the distances from our base at Cambridge, I reckon if I laid those out, I could probably get to the city of Birmingham. So that's a million. But we're talking about a billion. So how far is that going to take us if a million gets us from Cambridge to Birmingham? Well, how about circumnavigating the globe? And how about doing it four times? So we're not talking small amounts of money here. We're talking huge. So a billion is a massive investment in any project. These high tech projects, they need ambition, they need funding, and I argue they need the number sense. We need to value that. So back to our top five. And which one of those is going to be at number five in our chart as we work towards which project cost a billion? Let's see if you're right with the first one. At number five, we have SNCF's new rolling stock. OK, so this was a project in France for a couple of thousand new trains, larger than the old trains, faster than the old trains and hopefully more comfortable. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, if they're bigger and better, let's have a look at example from our own lives. Now, when I was a teenager, what I wanted more than anything was to own a Mini, okay? And in those days, it would have been the Mini on the left, although my Mini looked nothing like that. It had le led a very busy, fulfilled life, and um, it looked a bit sad compared to that one, but it was the one on the left that I had. SNCF, they upgraded their trains and a little bit like what happened with the Mini a few years ago when it got upgraded, things tend to get bigger. Now I know that if I had that Mini on the left, that would fit in my garage at home. The Mini on the right, I'm not so sure about. One thing I was always told growing up with a dad who's a carpenter was when you're doing any sort of job, you should always measure it twice and cut once. So is that what happened with the trains? Well, it turns out that SNCF did allow for the size of its trains in all the city stations. So they made sure it fitted. They kind of forgot that it would also have to use the rural stations though. So you have these fat new trains coming in to the rural stations and they no longer fitted. So what did they have to do? having spent a lot of money on their new trains, they had to go around and retrofit all their rural stations. They had to literally cut back the platforms so their new bigger trains would fit. What did that cost? What did that oversight about somebody just standing back and thinking, do you know what? These trains look a bit bigger. Do you think they're gonna fit into our stations? Because nobody actually did that at any point along the program and just asked the question, they ended up with a bill for $50 million to refit all of their stations, plus, of course, the That's delays that they incurred as well, and the storage costs in the new trains. So that gets us off the mark. And that's an example from France check a of check. a project that ended up costing quite a lot more than they planned. So where do we go next with our top five? Let's have an example from the air. This is one of my favorites. This is the Gimli Glider. Now, what I've tried to choose this afternoon are examples where there've been expensive mistakes, but no one's been hurt, okay? I think that was important to think about this um, particular talk. But with this, as you'll see, that 767 is a jet airliner. And it's called here, the Gimli Glider. So what happened? Well, this was a Air Canada internal flight. 
and it's an Air Canada internal flight that ran out of fuel halfway through its journey. Okay, the good news is the pilot and crew managed to land it safely. And because it was being go on fuel, it became known as the Gimli Glider. But what's really special about aviation is when they have a board of inquiry after an incident, they have this no blame culture. And the idea is that everybody shares what they know about what went wrong so we can all learn from it. And I think that's a really important point here that everybody concerned is willing to share what happened. Now the part that really caught my attention was the fact that it ran out of fuel halfway. That fraction of half, halving and doubling, it happens so much when we're using units. And straight away, I was curious because it's about fuel. I started thinking, I wonder, was this something to do with the way that they measured the fuel? And the accident and inquiry board found out that's exactly what happened. When the fuel was being measured, they found that the um, crew on the aircraft were working in two different units. Now, if you think about converting measures, and you're thinking maybe about kilograms and pounds, do you know the conversion? Are you using one yourself? I use a bag of sugar. I always think of a bag of sugar when I'm converting kilograms to pounds. I know a kilo of sugar is about 2.2 pounds, so I have that idea. But that problem, that converting the right way from kilograms and pounds is what went wrong with the Gimli glider. It ran out of fuel halfway, it had to land, luckily populated area, but it landed safely. So how did they have avoid this happening again? Because they have their board of inquiry, they know it's a units problem. What did they do? Well, Air Canada said from now on, we will only work in metric, okay? Their fuel would be in metric. Now that seems like a very simple solution. They've all gone for metric, okay? And that got me thinking, to when I use units in my everyday life. And this week, when I come across models with metric and imperial, and I'm guessing you can come up with a lot of examples yourselves, and maybe some of these ones that I'm sharing, you've come across too. So let's have a look. Okay, the first one is TVs. This week, I was given a job by my parents um, to get them a new television. Okay, fantastic, as jobs go, could be worse, it wasn't cutting the hedge or mowing the lawn, it was going out and buying them a new telly. But all of a sudden, there's that metric imperial confusion. And if you've bought a telly recently, you'll realize where I'm coming from here. I had to make sure it would fit on their cabinet. So I had to think length and width. What units did they sell tellies in, length and width? That was in centimeters. Okay, absolutely fine. Where does the problem and confusion come in? Of course, screen size. How do you measure screen size on a television? In inches, of course. So when we're looking at the measures for a television, half of the information is in imperial and half of it is in metric. Now, when I'm working with inches and centimeters, I tend to think about a ruler. 30, se 30 centimeter ruler is about 12 inches and that helps me convert. But it's pretty clear when I'm talking with family members, especially older family members, it gets incredibly confusing working with these numbers and trying to explain two systems. So that happened to me this week, but luckily we've got the telly, it did fit and it's working fine. So that's got a happy ending. What else have I come across this week where there's metric and imperial being be used at the same time? Find a cure for us. After years, well, my running magazine, possible. my running magazine um, was posing the question, okay, which is better? Do you measure your run in miles or kilometers? <laughs> you could say you've run the same distance, whether or not you've measured it in miles, kilometers, or hand spans, whatever it is you've done, it doesn't matter. But that made me think, if I'm going outside for a run, I measure my run in miles. I set my watch and I run it in miles because I drive in miles. I think in miles for longer journeys, okay? Kilometers, I tend to use if I'm down at the track or if I'm on the treadmill. And I've had to learn to go from one to the other, but it, years of experience have taught me to use the kilometers on the treadmill. That was fine until a couple of months ago, my gym brought in some new treadmills 
And there's me, long-term member, thinking in kilometres. You can guess what happened. The company delivered them and they were set up in miles. And there's me trying to do a speed session. Cue one evening, marking up a little card with all my conversions on. So next time I went in the gym, I'd get my times and my distances right. That worked well for the last couple of months. This week I went back in the gym and I put my figures in, I start running, and I'm basically going nowhere. What had happened? Yeah, you guessed it. Somebody had been on and changed the miles to kilometers. So the numbers I was typing in, I wasn't actually going that fast anymore. And I had to think back to my old system. So televisions, working both, treadmills, and if you do races, if you do a park run of 5K, it's about three miles. We use both systems, even though we're talking about a run or a television. Speaking with um, a friend, another member at the club who works as a midwife, she was telling me this week about the metric models where she works, because when they deliver a baby and they're asked to record its weight, they record it in metric, they record it in kilograms. And she said she has yet to have a family ask her to convert it into imperial. It, they get asked every single time. You know, it's lovely how many kilograms they are, thank you very much. What's that in real money? Because the whole family wants to know and want to be able to compare it to the other generations. So we have this metric model. We have it with televisions, we have it with treadmills, we have it from the very first day of our lives. And it's not something that's gonna go away, but one thing we can do is have that idea, that feel for the numbers ourselves, to be able to change the kilograms to pounds and be able to talk in that language so we avoid some of these mistakes. The Gimli glider, if they'd lost that aircraft, and thankfully they didn't, that would have been 160 million, got the word million there missing, 160 million dollars missing. So that would have been a very expensive mistake, not to mention the loss of life as well. So what comes next? Because we're working our way up to the billion. We've had the trains, there's the subs, we've had the Gimli glider, there's the satellites and the orbiter. So which one do you think is number three? Aha, I think I may have surprised you there. Okay, the NASA mission wasn't the most expensive, but possibly for an organization as large as they are, maybe this was one of the most embarrassing. So the Mars Climate Orbiter, I mean, this really ticked all the boxes for being a high-tech project. Okay, it was ambitious. This was about taking off on Earth, doing a nine-month journey across space, and then entering the Martian atmosphere. Okay, took two years to build that orbiter huge teams behind it, a lot of the work outsourced because so many specialties were needed to actually make this happen. So this was a massive investment of time and also it wasn't a standalone project because NASA, as you may know, had been looking to put bases onto Mars. So this was actually having some comms equipment on board and the idea was when it got to Mars, it would go into orbit and be able to support comms for future missions. Okay. So this was a huge program. Um, if we're looking at the costs of setting up, and this is 1998 costs, so it'd be even more now, okay? You're looking about 200 million to develop the resources for the orbiter. Launch costs, nearly a hundred million dollars. And then the mission cost during that nine month journey that it took to get to Mars, about another 43 million. So we really are talking an ambitious, huge project, massive government funding from the US government. It launched okay, did the journey to Mars okay. Where it went wrong was when it got there. You know, the bit that you think it's gonna be fine at, you've, you've launched it fine, that's the bit that people worry about. It's done that fantastic journey. It got to Mars and that's where it went wrong. Because when it got there, that's when you have to get your thrusters sorted, You've got to get yourself into the orbit. And guess what happened? The same problem that I had on a different scale when I was using the treadmill the other day. 
and are muddling up my metric and imperial. It turns out that the engineers who are working on the stress system, they're working in imperial. So they are measuring things in pound seconds. NASA, in contrast, well, they're working in metric and they were working with Newton seconds. The thing was, the problem was spotted. It was spotted long before takeoff, you know, nine months before this thing burnt up in the atmosphere. It was spotted and two employees apparently submitted the paperwork to their bosses and said, we spotted a mistake. Did anybody act on it? Well, yes, but not in the way you're expecting. The form was looked at and it was basically sent back because the form hadn't been filled in properly. So somebody did spot it, but it wasn't followed through. And it comes back to that responsibility we all have. What Margaret Brown says about putting it into context and looking at the numbers, do they make sense? And having that responsibility for checking and sharing the information, just like with the mountain bikes as well, flagging up when something doesn't look right. Having that number sense, it's almost like an intuition. Now, again, Mars mission, it's a flight mission, that no blame approach, the inquiry board reported on what happened. And yes, they had made some arithmetic mistakes. But when the board reported, it was interesting the conclusions that they drew. So I've taken um, a comment here from their report card. And said here, the problem, it wasn't the error. It was the failure of NASA's systems engineering, the checks and balances to detect the error. That's why we lost the spacecraft. Because no one's perfect. We all make mistakes. But it's about being professional enough to go back and check them and to take that responsibility when somebody gives your team the information that you don't just take it at face value. You get, sit down and you check it yourself. And that was NASA's conclusion because the actual problem seemed to happen with external contractor. That external contractor didn't get the blame. NASA took the blame because it wasn't checking things carefully. And there's a message here for ourselves when we're dealing with numbers as well. So let's go back a little bit and think about a calculation that I've done quite a lot of research on with young students that I've worked with, okay? So there you go, 702 to attract 695. I'm not asking you to put the answer in the chat. I'm not asking you for the answer at all. I've got a different question. How confident are you that your answer is correct? If you had to give your answer a score out of 10, zero being rather less confident than if you gave it a 10 saying you're certain you're right. Just by doing that and asking how confident you are. Researchers such as Colin Foster up at Loughborough University have found that that buy-in can really help with us getting increased accuracy in what we're doing. So putting things into context can help. And also, how confident are you? And when somebody asks how confident are you, did you go back and just check it just to make sure that you got it right so you could give yourself the 10 out of 10. Now, when I've given this question to older primary children, year sixes, just before they take their sats and they're about to go off to secondary school, when I've given them this question and I've asked them, how did you check your answer? Do you know what's lovely about them? They all nod and say, oh, yes, yes, miss. I checked that. Yes, definitely checked it. So I follow it up with a question and just said, can you tell me how you checked it? And when I ask them that second question, tell me how you checked it, that's when it becomes interesting. First off, some of them admit, well, actually they didn't. They just knew I was gonna ask, so they said yes. Others, they'd written it as a vertical calculation, 702 takes 695 vertically, and they just checked the numbers were in the right place. They'd done an admin check, but some of them had actually added the numbers rather than subtracted it. If they put it into context, that might not have happened. If I'd asked them how confident they were, maybe they would have checked it. The ones who tended to get it right, they were the ones who actually counted the difference. And there were some, not many, who were doing estimating. They were using the number sense and saying, look, that's about 700, 702. 
and taking 695, it's about 700, it's near. Those children who were looking at the numbers and using their number sense were <laughs> tended to be more Thanks, Lauren. than the ones who Look at Lauren there. with her helpful, and it's that's what the I'm answer really is seven. About I'm thinking about that's number what... sense. It's having different oh, ways man. to do a calculation and knowing the best way of doing it. So having those checking skills is what NASA found was so important and was missing from their NCEs. I, I feel but it's something that we can do in our own lives. But it's, it's going to be easy helpful because the way we're taught at school and the calculations that we're given to then develop that sense of checking. Now, this is from 1945. It's from a research paper that I was looking at, and it's a teacher asking the class, "Is the teacher's working out correct?" And this just blew the minds of the class. They were so shocked that the teacher could actually question the teacher's work rather than the student's work. The question was strange to them. They went silent. So I think that's a really important message that valuing checking and modeling checking and checking each other's work is just so important. But perhaps we don't do enough of it if a whole class falls silent when they're asked to do so by their teacher. So are we any better as adults? Well, at the weekend, if you think that far back before we had the snow this week, at the weekend, it was gorgeous sunny weather. And I've got a garden chair, it's a bit like that. It's a green one, it's very comfortable. And I bought it online. Turns out I was quite lucky, not with the weather. Um, a sunny weekend is always a blessing, but we can't guarantee them. But when it arrived, it was the size that I was hoping for. But when I went on Twitter and had a look for examples, it was bursting with examples of when people had been on internet shopping channels and perhaps didn't get the chair that they were expecting. So let's have a look at some examples where that's gone wrong. There we go. This looked like a fantastic, comfortable chair. However, always read the description while shopping. A little bit smaller than she was expecting. And I love this example. They ordered the chairs and they were meant for toddlers. Just shows it can happen to any of us, but checking and using your number sense, because sometimes smaller items can actually be more expensive, it can be harder to make. So the price doesn't always give it away. But having a feel for the numbers and the sizes is absolutely <laughs> crucial. So we've had the examples of the trains that were too wide, the Gimli glider that ran out of fuel, and the Mars orbiter where there was the metric muddle. So that leaves us with two expensive mistakes. So the question is, which one is at number two? Done the train, would not have the sub, aeroplane done, there's the rocket and NASA. So the second one is Ariane 5. Ariane 5 obviously replaced Ariane 4. And we've got an example here from the European Space Agency. And we've just had the example from NASA. So what went wrong with Ariane? Well, it's a very different mistake than happened with Mars. For starters, the Mars mission did take off successfully and traveled for nine months. Ariane 5? Well, I can't measure its journey in months or weeks or days or hours. I can't even measure it in minutes. It turns out that the voyage of Ariane 5, the first voyage, lasted all of 37 seconds. After 37 seconds, it had um, turned 90 degrees and was falling rapidly towards the Earth. What happened? Well, I suppose the nearest way I can describe it is if you think about a millimeter on a car and how many numbers it can store, or maybe if your fridge freezer's full and you're trying to get more into it, basically it ran out of number space. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, I had a mini a bit like that. Um, in fact, I think mine was probably in worse condition. Um, fuel gauge didn't work. It only gave me a reading for the top half. So I used to have to remember when I filled it up and try and work out my mileage. The brakes weren't much use either. And the minometer, the odometer, well, that had been round the clock. So this is the car I dreamed of, the millimeter I dreamed of, because that one's got delivery only mileage. My car didn't have that, but it was a well-loved vehicle. 
And if you're used to seeing these things, uh, obviously the numbers turn over. So after a thousand miles, it would look like that. And when I was a young driver and I did my first thousand miles, my parents marked it with a little badge to say, yes, you've done your first thousand miles, well done. My car had done a lot more than that, but it had survived my driving, so that was good news. What's the largest number you can get on there, do you think? Where does it get full, the maximum? There we go. So when we get to that point and we have a car, it's gone round the clock and it starts again. And we just have to be careful if we're the ones going out and buying this car, that we allow for the fact that that is a possibility. Today it's with computers and the screens will allow for more digits. But this was kind of the problem when we went from Ariane 4 to Ariane 5, okay? Because with Ariane 4, they had the computers, they knew the number, amount of data they needed, and they knew the size, and they made sure they had plenty of space. So they weren't coming back like I do from the supermarket, wondering if it's all gonna fit in the freezer. Okay, the team at Ariane 4 knew it fitted. The team doing Ariane 5, well, they were putting in bigger and better computers. They were dealing with bigger numbers. It was going faster. But what nobody did was say, is there room for all this? Because some of the numbers they were dealing with were decimals and they had what they called an integer floating system, but it works very much like this. But when you try and put those decimal numbers into binary, you end up with lots of digits. And before you know it, the space is full. Now, this wasn't like my mini when it just starts off over again. When it got full on Ariane 5's computer, the whole thing shut itself down, there was a failure, and there was the loss of the rocket, along with the three satellites that were on board there too. So what we've got is a couple of examples of space missions which were highly ambitious, which were very well funded, but which both failed because of basic number sense. One was converting units and do you check them answers? And the other one was thinking about the amount of space and the digits that they were dealing with. So that means that we've now got four of our top five most expensive mistakes on our journey up to a billion dollar mistake. So what did the Ariane 5 mistake cost? They reckon $400 million, not to mention all the time that had been lost when they're trying to develop the program. And of course, the three satellites that were lost, the commercial organizations that were badly affected by this failure too. They got the program sorted in the end, but there were those losses. So that means we've got one project left, one high tech project that was ambitious, that was well funded, but it failed due to number sense. And what's really special about our number one is not only does it break that billion dollar bracket? Not only does it do that, but also there are not one, but two examples of number sense failing the project, okay? So this definitely deserves to be our number one this evening. So what was it? If you've been following our top five, you'll already know which one it is. The one we've not done on there is the submarine, okay? So let's go for it. It's about updating the Spanish submarine fleet, the S-80s. The Spanish government decided that it wanted new, bigger and better submarines. So it was ambitious and it was well-funded because it was a government project. So it should surely be a huge success. They went ahead and they ordered their submarines and they were an awful long way through the project when somebody realized there was a problem. And when we're talking, these, these submarines were pretty much built, okay? Designed, constructed, somebody's standing there looking at it and they're doing that. And basically what they told the Navy was, you know, when you want a submarine, it's got some basic expectations. You want it to be able to submerge and you want it to be able to resurface. A couple of basic things you want a sub to do. When that person was looking at it going, not sure about that, that person realized that basically what the Spanish Navy had designed was a very, very expensive brick. Now, I've done life-saving, and when you do life-saving in a swimming pool, you spend a long time rescuing bricks, and you learn very quickly 
that brinks, bricks will sink to the bottom of the pool and they will stay there. They're very good at submerging and they're rubbish at resurfacing. And this is what they've done with the subs. The Spanish Navy had put so much equipment into such a small space that all it could do, their new sub, was go down. Coming back up just wasn't going to happen. So they had far too much in there. But that's OK, because they realised it before they went up to sea and did the trials. But what would you do if you've got this sub and there's too much crammed into it? Well, they came up with a couple of solutions. They could either make it wider or they could make it longer. What did they do? They chose to make them longer. So this was back in 2013. To make their subs longer, and they worked out they would make them 10 metres longer, from 71 metres to 81 metres, to make their subs longer, the metre cost was $9 million. They wanted to make them 10 metres longer, and they had to do it to four subs. Okay, so a bit of egg on the face that they maybe designed a very expensive brick, but they got round it. They made them longer, they put in the extra money, they spent the extra time doing it, and the subs seemed to be working fine. Forward wind to 2018. Four submarines ready to go. They can submerge, they can resurface. It's a good job, yes? Maybe not, because now they hit a problem that the French railways might have recognised. Because you may have made something bigger and better, and in this case, 10 metres longer than they originally considered, but you have to park it. And with a submarine, you have bays and docks where they park them alongside and they can work on them, they can load them up and they can store them. But of course, this was 10 metres longer than the original plan. Suddenly, their fantastic new subs couldn't be parked up in the base. So the next thing they had to do was go to their base, they had to dredge them out and they had to elongate them as well. So not one, but two embarrassing mistakes because of the number sense. Nobody spotted that they were putting too much in because there was a decimal point wrong in the calculations. I think we've all been there and either done it ourselves or know somebody who's got the decimal point wrong. Think about the mountain bike example. And then when the submarines were larger than they had before, nobody stood back and went, oh, do you reckon they're going to fit? Just like they didn't with the train example as well. So we're coming across common mistakes here in all the problems. But with these projects, they're expensive mistakes. And when you're dealing with things like these submarines, they're very expensive mistakes. And not only that, you've got the glare of the world on you. And it didn't take long for other countries to pick up on the Spanish Navy's mistake. So where do you look for comment? Well, you go to social media, obviously. So this is what I found. One country said, hmm, interesting chain of miscalculations. Never imagined this could be possible in a modern Navy. OK, that was the Russian ambassadors, the deputy Russian ambassadors to the UN commenting on the Spanish Navy's issues trying to deliver their new submarines. So. The Spanish Navy, not one, but two problems with its number sense, overlooking a decimal point area error and nobody picking it up. And then the idea about estimating and having a feel for size and dimensions. Two basic things that we need in our own everyday lives as well. But what did it cost? Because this talk, after all, is about the most expensive, the billion dollar mistake. Have we got that for number one? Well, we've not only got it, we've kind of blown it out of the water. Those mistakes ended up costing the Spanish Navy upwards of two billion pounds. And if you think back to the start of our journey together this evening, just how far, if you laid those out in dollar bills, that might take you. Two billion goes an awful long way. But what I would argue 
is that all of these mistakes were avoidable because there's three key factors when we're dealing with a high tech project. And hopefully I've convinced you of that now. One of those key factors is to be ambitious. And each project that we look at here is ambitious. Faster, more efficient trains, efficient air travel between cities, exploring the galaxy, putting satellites into space and exploring the ocean floor. They're all ambitious and they're all well-funded too. They fell down in each case because of number sense. Something we started to learn at school, but maybe we don't value in our everyday lives. So how can we avoid it ourselves? Well, one thing we can do is when somebody gives us some information, to check it. Not just look at it and nod and go, oh, that looks about right. But actually, if somebody was asking you on a confidence score, how confident you are about the other person's numbers, would you give it a 10? Or would you go back and just have another look at it? No, before you cut that piece of wood, before you buy the new car and try and fit it in the garage, how confident are you? Because one thing we find is young children, if we're not careful, they'll use the method they've been most recently taught and ditch the others. But those other methods can give them a way of checking. So it's not a question of if you've learned something new, forget the old. It's a question if you've learned something new and you can use the old way to check it. So thank you very much indeed for your time this evening. I hope you've enjoyed the talk and I think we've got some time to take some questions and Julia's going to come on in a minute about those. And there's a link there feedback as well. Julia, over to you. Ems, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. It was a really great journey that you took us on there and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think everyone else did too. Um, with the questions, because of the numbers involved, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, if you look at your controls, Zoom controls, you'll see the Q&A option. And if you want to type your question in the Q&A section, then we'll look at the most popular questions and try and answer a couple of them in the time that we have left. And I can see a couple of questions that look very interesting. Um, you talked a little bit about tips for avoiding similar mistakes. You've talked a lot about number sense. And we have a couple of questions about how to develop number sense. And I'm guessing that as the director of the university's flagship mathematics education program, and also a researcher in the Faculty of Education, you probably have some ideas on this. So Ems, do you want to give us a, a brief idea of how could you develop number sense? Thanks, Julia. And thank you for those questions as well, for the um, people who sent those in. Yeah, um, number sense is something you have to practice. It's almost like a muscle. You've got to use it or you lose it. And just having that feel for numbers, that playing for numbers, it's something I've looked at in my research and I've worked with, with my colleagues at Enrich as well. So what we've done is we've developed some resources aimed at primary children, so younger family members. And it's a really good place to start is with younger family members. And we've developed some resources there, which you can get to if you visit Enrich and you click on the primary area of our website. And once you've gone to primary, if you then click our features, you can find an area, a feature that's called developing flexibility with numbers. And what we've done there is we've put on loads of different activities where you might not even be asked to calculate something, but to use your number sense to approximate it, to check an answer, or maybe work a different way and compare methods. Um, and we've got some fantastic resources on there. So I think the first thing I'd suggest is go to the Enrich site, have a look at those resources. And if you're a little bit older, there's loads of opportunities to practice number sense. I mean, one of them is the supermarket. As we're going around, keep an idea of what you think it's gonna cost and then see when you get to the till, just how close you are to the actual total. So it's just like going to the gym. You have to exercise your number sense and keep it in tip-top condition. And hopefully that'll help avoid 
some of these mistakes. Thanks, Ems, that's great. And we have a couple of other questions around a sort of similar theme about the idea of testing to avoid mistakes. Um, you talked a bit about the no blame culture and about the importance of uh, being able to raise issues when you think that there's a problem. You've given some examples of very expensive mistakes, but what advice would you have about trying things that are new or a bit difficult or beyond your comfort zone and also about learning from, from things when they go wrong? Well, I think there's that saying, isn't there, that it's not a problem if you already know the answer. So I think part of the fun of doing maths and working with arithmetic and calculations is actually playing with the numbers and trying something out. And the reason that we check is that we do make mistakes and sometimes we can learn from those mistakes as well. So one thing that I think is really important is not to worry about a mistake because we all make them. It's about how we check them and how we learn from them. And I think they're two crucial things. So if I'm doing a calculation, maybe long division calculation, okay, I can do that and there's an awful lot of steps to it. But how do I go about checking I've got it right? And it's that essential, maybe having more than one way of doing things. And do you know what? If you get stuck, sometimes you need to do things a different way anyway. So by making mistakes, getting stuck, we're actually learning to think mathematically because yeah, if you already know the answer, it's not a problem. Making mistakes is all part of the process and it can be part of the fun as well. Thank you, that's such a great way of looking at it. If anyone else has any other questions, there's a couple of seconds to quickly type them in. This is a test of your speed typing. That's an interesting idea. Is there anything that we can learn from the way that people responded to these mistakes? NASA were really open in their conclusions in their review and very honest about where the failures had come from. Is there anything that's publicly available and able to be shared about the lessons learned from the other mistakes? I think it's very different when it's a commercial organisation than when it's aviation because they have that um, that culture of openness. I mean, there's a huge difference with medicine than there is aviation. But what I think is absolutely wonderful is that when we encourage that and we discuss it and have that atmosphere, if it's OK to make a mistake, we talk about it and we learn from it. So if you're in a culture where that doesn't happen, perhaps you're the person that can bring it in because we can see the value from industries like aviation of learning from each other's mistakes. So if it's not already happening where you are, perhaps you can be the trailblazer and bring it in. Thank you. That's such a great lesson to take away. So as Em said, uh, you'll have got an email with the link to the feedback form. We would really love to have your feedback on this talk. It really helps us with future events as well as being great to learn what you think about today's event as well. So if you could take just a couple of minutes to fill that in, we'd be hugely grateful. But meanwhile, I just want to say thank you to Ems, Dr. Ems Lord. Thanks, Ems Lord. The project here at the University of Cambridge. In education. It's its 25th birthday this year. So if you haven't used it already, do go and take a look. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. We hugely enjoyed it. I can see all the comments in the chat about how much people enjoyed it too. Thank you for joining us all today. We really appreciate having you as the audience and thank you again, Ems, for a fantastic talk. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>